Once the Truth Once the truth of the strings had been acknowledged by all but the final few holdouts, the new world came into focus, a garden in which many inhabitants had eaten the apple, while the rest remained too scared to bite. The weight of this revelation, this one's unthinkable knowledge, continued to solidify in people's hearts and minds. It grew heavier and heavier, applying more and more pressure, until finally, inevitably, some cracked underneath it. Homes and possessions were sold, jobs were abandoned, all in the pursuit of making the most of one's time. Some wanted to travel, to live on the beach, to spend time with their children, to paint and to sing and to write and to dance. Others dove into an abyss of anger, envy, and violence. In Texas, a week after the incident at Memorial Hospital, another short stringer gunman opened fire in a shopping mall. Two back-to-back -back shootings perpetrated by short stringers set off a media frenzy. Should we fear more attacks by short stringers? The Chirons asked. In London, three computer scientists nearing the end of their strings hacked into the accounts of a major bank and made away with 10 million pounds, presumably in the hope of living out their final years on a secluded island without extradition. Stories circulated on social media of couples calling off their weddings just days in advance upon learning each other's fates, while others eloped in Las Vegas, their rushed nuptials like a raised middle finger to the boxes at their doors. A small number of short stringers decided to use their remaining time to take revenge on those who had wronged them. When the target of one's rage had a long string, any murderous efforts would inevitably, inevitably prove futile, so other ways were found to exact pain. Ordinary folk behaved like mafios. Windows were smashed, homes were burned, legs were broken, money was stolen. Both embittered and emboldened by the knowledge that they wouldn't live to suffer a lengthy imprisonment, some short stringers felt almost invincible. There was no need to fear death row if you were already sitting there. And the risk of taking and the risk taking of those with the shortest strings was matched by those with the longest. Buoyed by the assurance that they would live through old age, they went skydiving and drag racing and experimented with hard drugs. They forgot that having a long string only promised them survival. It didn't preclude them from injury or illness. It didn't mean they would go unpunished. News anchors, doctors, talk show hosts, and politicians urged long stringers to remember they were not invulnerable. You've been given the ultimate gift of a long life, they said. You don't want to spend it in a coma or in prison. But despite the dramatic acts of those with long strings, it was still the short stringers who caused the greatest alarm. Surely those who turned to violence accounted for only a minuscule fraction of the full population of short stringers, but there was a sharp enough rise in criminal acts to stoke public anxiety. And while most of the world's long stringers could sympathize with the short stringers' anger and grief, they couldn't help but grow fearful. People began whispering about those with dangerously short strings, a particularly ill-fated community with members in every city and every country who found themselves staring into a future whose brevity ensured little to no consequences for their actions and whose rapidly approaching end served as a blunt and brutal reminder that there would be no cosmic rewards for ethical behavior, no late-in-life blessings, no tangible motive to do good. This caricature of the extremist short stringer with regard for neither public law nor moral order seeped into classrooms and boardrooms, into hospitals and households, and it eventually trickled into the offices of high-ranking politicians in countries across the globe. In America, where the populace had proven time and again to be particularly susceptible to paranoia, suspicions took root deeply and quickly. It was estimated that the number of short stringers, those whose strings ended before age 50, hovered between 5 and 15 percent of the country's total population, a small number, yes, but not small enough to be ignored. A few short-term measures had been enacted, a bandage on a gaping wound. Several states formed dedicated hotlines under the slogan, Don't Look Alone, encouraging residents to speak with a trained professional while opening up their boxes. 
Congress debated special aid to short stringers, eviction bans, one-time payments, but ultimately fell to gridlock as the particulars proved unmanageable. Just how short must a string be to qualify? And was there a risk in offering a financial incentive to look, pressuring those who had cho chosen otherwise? But nothing could stop the swelling rumors fed by every act of violence until the mayors, governors, and senators began to quietly discuss a different matter, distinct from earlier efforts to help. Though it wouldn't be until the events of June 10th that the president would decide the short stringer issue had reached a boiling point and significant action needed to be taken. Anthony. When the strings appeared in March, most Americans briefly forgot about the next year's presidential election, the campaigns for which were just getting underway. Many of the major magazines and newspapers even canceled their planned features on the candidates. But Anthony Rollins did not forget. A blue-blooded congressman from Virginia with uninspiring polling figures, Anthony Rollins saw the strings as a blessing from God. At the end of February, before the arrival of the strings and just after Anthony announced his candidacy, a former college classmate appeared on CNN to claim she had once overheard a drunken Anthony make crass, sexist comments about female partygoers at his fraternity. She also recounted that freshman girls were warned not to drink the punch at Anthony's frat house after several incidents in which women experienced memory loss after a party and a male student even died from alcohol poisoning. Anthony's team quickly crafted a response noting that Anthony, as the son and grandson of several remarkable women, had always treated the opposite gender with the utmost respect. The statement confirmed that Anthony had attended various events hosted by his college fraternity, during which occasions alcohol had been consumed by all, but that he had no recollection of any particular punch. Before any other classmates could appear on any other national news outlets, the boxes mysteriously appeared, and any interest in Anthony's college antics dissipated overnight. That morning, almost three months ago, Anthony and his wife, Catherine, brought their two small boxes into the living room and debated what to do. Anthony called his campaign manager, who advised him not to open his. Anthony was a public figure, after all, and if the message on the box were indeed true, then any sensitive information about Anthony's life was at risk of being stolen and leaked to the press. Catherine called her friends from church, who also advised her not to open the box, warning that the end times were surely near. Do you think that's really what's happening? Catherine asked her husband, clutching her King James Bible. It says right here in Revelation, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Maybe these boxes are some sort of tabernacles? God dwelling among us? Anthony was skeptical. Doesn't it also talk about waves of destruction and water turning to blood? An entirely new world emerging? Well, how else can you explain it then? Anthony took the Bible from his wife's hands and placed it on the table next to their unopened boxes. A few days ago, our campaign was under attack, Anthony said. Now people couldn't care less about what that woman thinks she remembers from college. I believe these boxes are a sign from God that he's looking out for this campaign, protecting us from harm. Catherine wasn't fully convinced, but she took a breath and let her shoulders loosen. I hope you're right. Anthony smiled and kissed his wife. Besides, even if the world were ending, he said, you and I are shoo-ins to be saved. It didn't take long for Anthony and Catherine, along with the rest of the world, to understand the truth of their strings. When they ultimately opened their boxes to reveal strings of substantial length, promising at least 80 years for them both, they knew they had been blessed with a wondrous gift, rewarded for their faith. At church the following Sunday, they gave thanks for their good fortune and asked for guidance on the long campaign ahead. Catherine even wore her lucky suit, a crimson skirt and matching blazer that complemented the color of Anthony's favorite tie and made her look like a young Nancy Reagan. It was the same outfit she had worn on the cold morning in January, when Anthony had been sworn into Congress, and the same one she sultrily peeled off whenever the two of them 
role-played as Mr. and Mrs. President in bed. As the man at the pulpit assured his congregation that God would lead them through this tumultuous time, and Catherine dutifully nodded along, Anthony sent up a prayer of his own, that their two long strings were just the beginning, a harbinger of even greater things to come. Throughout March and April and May, Anthony's small campaign staff continued to canvas and tweet and poll voters, while most of the world was busy deciding how to react to the irrevocable changes around them. And despite the underwhelming turnouts, Anthony insisted on continuing his rallies and engagements. After all, it was his wife's family signing most of the checks. Anthony had married his college sweetheart, Catherine Hunter, on her family's 300-acre estate in Virginia nearly 25 years earlier, when he was just a young prosecutor in the district attorney's office, and she was a new board member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, both equally hungry for something bigger. And now they were on the cusp of it. Anthony and Catherine didn't have any children, but ever since the campaign's kickoff back in February, members of the Hunter family had attended nearly all of Anthony's events. It was especially helpful whenever Catherine could convince her camera-shy nephew, Jack Hunter, to appear with them on stage, sporting the crisp-cut uniform of a 22-year-old Army cadet and reminding voters just how strongly Anthony supported the troops. But even with the Hunter's help, Anthony knew his campaign was still struggling to be heard over the commotion of the strings and the voices of the better-known candidates. And as the spring pressed on, Anthony waited for something, anything, the catalyst his campaign desperately needed. At the end of May, he got it. One of the campaign volunteers, an older woman named Sharon, told her supervisor that she needed to speak with Anthony and Catherine directly. When they gathered in an office, Sharon explained that her daughter attended college with Wes Johnson Jr., the 19-year-old son of Ohio Senator Wes Johnson Sr., who happened to be the candidate currently polling just ahead of Anthony. Small world, said Catherine, intrigued. Well, my daughter is friends with Wes Jr.'s girlfriend, and that's how she heard Wes's father is close to the end of his string, Sharon said. Wes is devastated. The son, not the father. Although, I imagine the father must be devastated, too. Anthony's eyes narrowed, already running through the options in his head. Obviously, that's terrible news, he said soberly. Tragic, said Catherine. But we appreciate you sharing it with us. Anthony shook Sharon's hand. Once Sharon and her supervisor left, Catherine turned to her husband. I don't know about you, but I think we have a duty to inform our fellow citizens that if they elect Wes Johnson as president, he may very well die in office. We'll have to tread carefully here, Anthony cautioned. But once this gets out, Wes will surely have to withdraw. Catherine wrapped her arms gleefully around her husband's waist. You were right, honey, she said. God's on our side. 